Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Welcome to another session of Economy this week, wherein we are taking all the important economy related articles which have appeared in various business related newspapers from 29th of October to 4th of November 2022. Let's begin the discussion. The first very important article that appeared is Government of India or to be very precise NHAI announcing Infrastructure Investment Trust. Now understand the logic here. UPSC if they ask you a question, I don't think they will ask you a question about NHAI Infrastructure Investment Trust per se. But what they might test you is in the concept of Infrastructure Investment Trust. The idea is very simple here. Don't complicate the ideas. The Infrastructure Investment Trust is just like a mutual fund. What happens in a mutual fund? Here are the investors. They will give the money rather than saying give the money. They will invest the money into a mutual fund company that is asset management company. So this asset management company or a mutual fund company will pool in the investments and invest in the debt market or equity market or both of them and give the returns to the investors who have purchased mutual fund units. Now rather than writing mutual fund units here, I will replace the mutual fund unit with infrastructure investment trust. Infrastructure investment trust. And instead of writing investors here, let's imagine you have invested in the infrastructure investment trust. You have purchased the units in the infrastructure investment trust. Now this infrastructure investment trust will invest in the infrastructure. It could be, let's say, a road. It could be any other type of infrastructure. Let me take the example here. This infrastructure investment trust and underline the term trust here because these are registered as a trust, not as companies, not as anything else. These are registered as a trust under the Trust Act. Now this trust will be set up. You will invest in the trust they will use the money to develop infrastructure or maintain the infrastructure, earn revenues and whatever revenues they have earned, part of the revenues are given to you. This is the basic idea of Infrastructure Investment Trust. Now coming to this NHAI, why this has been, been discussed in the newspaper, why have I picked up this article? The answer is very simple here. Government of India couple of years ago, 2019, the Union Cabinet approved setting up of National Highways Authority of India Infrastructure Investment Trust. And by setting up this particular Infrastructure Investment Trust, now the NHAI has been able to generate lot of money or let's say collect lot of money and will be using it to invest in the development of national highways or road infrastructure and will be providing returns to the investors who have invested in the Infrastructure Investment Trust. As per the document that has been published, they have issued certain debt instruments. These debt instruments right, are basically secured. They are offering more than just a tad bit above 8% rate of interest. These are certain very important points regarding NHAI, Infrastructure Investment Trust. And Mr. Nitin Gadkari, who is the minister, in one of the speeches stated that with the launch of this infrastructure investment trust, now the NHI is going to issue non-convertible debentures, NCD, non-convertible debentures to the tune of 1430 crores which have been issued, money has been collected. There was a very high amount of oversubscription into this. What do you mean by oversubscription? Imagine the government or let's say the NHI here wants to issue 10 instruments but the subscription is so high that there is a subscription of more than 10 instruments that is investors want to purchase let's say 50 of these instruments or collectively they want to purchase 100 of these instruments so government wants to issue 10 but the demand is for 100 instruments this in simple terms is referred to as over subscription so this NCD non-convertible debentures which were issued by NHAI were oversubscribed and government or let's say the minister here 
says that out of these instruments, 25% of these instruments were kept reserved for retail investors, such as you, such as me. And going forward, more and more percentage of these instruments which will be issued will be reserved for retail investors so that they can invest, use it as a die basically one more type of an instrument in the market, diversify their investments and because these are very very safer instruments in the market, these are secured and are offering around 8% rate of interest that will provide one more avenue for the retail investors to earn better rate of returns. So these are certain very important points regarding NHAI, IN or Infrastructure Investment Trust. Now based on this I have given an MCQ. Consider the following statements regarding Infrastructure Investment Trust. First one, these are regulated by SEBI. Statement one is correct. Right? These are regulated by SEBI. Second, NHAI, the Infrastructure Investment Trust will help in achieving NMP National Monetization Pipeline. Under the National Monetization Pipeline, the concept is simple here. Many of you will be confused, sir, how it is connected to NMP. Logic is, if NHAI will issue the instruments in the market, collect money, invest in development of road network in India. And road network is a part of National Monetization Pipeline under which more than 8,000, 9,000 infrastructure projects are being targeted. More than 111 lakh crore worth of investment is targeted. So if road infrastructure is going to be developed, bettered under this trust, don't you think it will help government of India in achieving national monetization pipeline? Second statement, by the way, is correct. Third statement, the infrastructure investment trusts are registered as Alternate Investment Funds, AIFs, Alternate Investment Funds under SEBI. AIFs are registered under SEBI, no doubt. Remember this, there are three categories of AIFs, Category 1, Category 2 and Category 3. These AIFs by default are coming under the regulation or they are under the regulation of SEBI. But this Infrastructure Investment Trust, like I told you earlier, it is a trust. It is not an alternative investment fund, it is a trust. So third statement is wrong. So one and two is correct. This question has been given on the lines of the trend in the UPSC where they are asking you two pairs are correct, one pair is correct, right, etc. like this. So two statements are correct. Right option for this question will be option B, right, only two statements are correct here. Let me go to the next article. Government of India is thinking of entering into rupee trade with multiple countries, specifically some of the African countries with whom right now we have very small amount of trade. Now what is this idea? Earlier we had a trade with Russia and Western countries imposed sanctions on Russia and as a result of this we were unable to bypass the SWIFT system initially of course and the trade between India and Russia was disrupted. And the problem with this is, whenever there is a sanction imposed by Western countries, it is not going to affect only the country on which the sanctions have been imposed. It will have an impact on all the other countries which are trading with the country. For example, what Russia is doing in Ukraine, we have no relation to it whatsoever. We did not promote it. But the US sanctions or the G7 sanctions on Russia, is affecting the trade between India and Russia. And that is the precise reason when government of India decided to ditch the idea of converting rupee into dollar and conducting trade with Russia and instead utilize the concept of rupee trade itself. That is the trade will be conducted directly with Russia without having to convert rupee into dollar will trade with Russia directly in terms of rupee. Now we are trying to emulate or use the same system with other countries with whom we have very small amount of trade or a very small percentage of the trade that we are doing right now is with these countries. What kind of countries? Djibouti, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Ethiopia, Sudan, etc. So these are some of the countries with whom we are negotiating and we want to have a trade in terms of rupee. Now what is the advantage? The advantage is one, 
if we can conduct a trade with rupee we are no more dependent on the swift system and if any country with whom we are conducting trade there is no need to convert currencies there is no need to convert rupee into dollar or rupee into any other currency we can directly trade in rupee with these countries then our trade will not be affected whenever other countries will come under sanction just like Russia was brought under sanction and apart from this it will also help internationalization of rupee that is more and more countries if they start accepting rupee that is whenever the trade is done whenever transactions are done if they start accepting rupee as a mode of a payment then it will help us in internationalization of the rupee and the third if more and more trade is conducted in rupee it will help in utilizing the domestic payment systems that we have developed in conducting or in completing the transactions and that is where institutions such as reserve bank of india npci etc will have to play a very important role and promote the rupee trade with these countries so these are certain very important points regarding rupee trade promotion being done by government of india now next important article abuse of lrs for offshore betting under cbic lens now in the last couple of months cbic has been there in the newspaper very often please be very very careful now come to the article here what is the article discussing reserve bank of india back in the year 2004 introduced a scheme by the name of liberalized remittances scheme lrs liberalized remittances scheme under the liberalized remittance scheme or i'll start using the short form lrs right now the citizens in india or an individual in india can basically remit up to 2.5 lakh dollars per annum i repeat the residents in india on an annual basis can remit up to 2.5 lakh rupees into any other market but please understand there are certain conditions here what are the conditions you can remit these particular currencies in many transactions what do i mean by this it's not compulsory that at one shot you'll have to remit these 2.5 lakh dollars if you want to split it into two transactions you want to do it two times that is you are you're basically transferring let's say or you're remitting in the month of let's say june one lakh dollars and in the month of December, you are remitting one and a half lakh dollars. Cumulatively, you have remitted two and a half lakh dollars. Now, many of you ask, sir, what if I want to remit more than 2.5 lakh? Is it allowed? Of course, yes, it will be allowed. But in such cases, you will have to take the approval from Reserve Bank of India. Now, under LRS, which was introduced, it promoted remittances up to 2.5 lakh dollars per annum, even minus were allowed to remit the amount but for what purposes this is a very tricky statement remember this under lrs you are allowed to remit money for current account transactions or capital account transactions within the balance of payment i'll repeat the statement it's important remember this under lrs you are allowed to remit up to 2.5 lakh dollars per annum either for current account transactions or for capital account transactions or a combination of both for example right imagine your sibling goes to usa for study purposes you can remit dollars from india you want to go for tour right let's say to any other country you are allowed to remit dollars from india right you want to invest in the stock market outside india you are allowed to remit under lrs so the remittances are allowed under lrs but in the same way where rb is allowing certain transactions which are allowed under lrs there are certain more transactions which are prohibited under lrs for example whatever amount you have taken under lrs remitted from india to rest of the world you are not allowed to use it in let's say forex market in other countries for trading in the forex market in other countries you are not allowed to use this amount for betting purposes outside india there are many of these transactions for which lrs cannot be utilized it is prohibited 
and one more point before going forward I have been using the term dollars here and because I am using dollars many of you will simply come to a conclusion in such cases the RBI will allow only the conversion of rupee to dollar statement would be wrong please remember this I am using dollars because dollar is a universal currency most of the transactions in the global market happen in dollars hence I am using dollar but it doesn't mean that you are allowed to remit only in dollars rupee to dollar no you are allowed to remit into pound as well you are allowed to remit in the form of euro you are allowed to remit in the form of Chinese renminbi US dollars etc that is the basic idea of freely usable currencies remember this freely usable currencies IMF has a list of currencies which are designated as freely usable currencies now what do you mean by freely usable currencies logic is that IMF gives two parameters and any currency in the global market will satisfy these two characteristics or two conditions are generally referred to as freely usable currencies for example IMF says if the global trade in terms of transactions if these currencies are majorly utilized I will designate this as a freely usable currency or right, in another case IMF also says in the forex market across the global market or across the globe as such if the domestic currencies are majorly converted into these currencies I will designate these as well as freely usable currencies right now pound euro renminbi US dollar as well as Japanese yen are referred to as freely usable currencies and if you have observed it very carefully the value of STR which are issued by IMF reserve assets which are issued by IMF the value of STR is determined by the basket of the very same currencies right so you can remit from rupee into any of these currencies but the total in a particular year should be 2.5 lakh rupees now the concern is that CBIC says that is central board of indirect taxes and customs alleges that there are many investors in India investors in the sense individuals remember this LRS is applicable to individuals if it is a Hindu undivided family not allowed if it is a company not allowed these are not eligible under LRS that is what I am trying to say here the CBIC alleges that many of these individuals have given a wrong data to the Reserve Bank of India that is the reasoning that they have given to remit the currencies are not the right ones that is imagine there is an investor an individual who has told RBI that they want to take out let's say 1 lakh dollars from India and they want to invest in the stock market in USA so RBI says very well then you are allowed under LRS but rather than investing in the stock market in USA what this individual has done is he has used the 1 lakh dollars to place a bet in any of these particular online or let's say any of these offshore betting agencies and CBAC alleges that these betting agencies have representatives in India who are luring these investors to invest in these offshore betting accounts or betting right activities and the third very important point is these betting activities are being conducted in a safe haven right many of the countries are designated as safe havens these are being conducted there and fourth very very important point as a result of all of this the tax evasion is happening in India I'll repeat as a result of all of this a tax evasion is happening in India so citing all of this CBIC says that we are going to request for details of for what purposes the remittances have been done for many of these investors or many of these individuals for the last six months and we'll try to plug this misuse of liberalized remittances scheme so this is the gist of the article provided here let me go to the MCQ based on this consider the following statements regarding LRS transactions under LRS are allowed under both capital and current account under the balance of payments statement one is correct by the way the LRS allows remittances to be made in dollars euro pound renminbi and yen statement two is also correct 
राइट ऑप्शन विल बी ऑप्शन ऑप्शन सी बोथ वन एंड टू ऑप्शन सी बोथ वन एंड टू इज द राइट ऑप्शन लेट मी गो द नेक्स्ट आर्टिकल इंडिया हैज अग्रीड टू प्रोवाइड सर्टन टेक्निकल लेट्स ए कॉपरेशन फॉर अफगानिस्तान बैंकिंग सेक्टर सर व्हाई दिस इज इंपॉर्टेंट शुड वी रीड इट ना प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड वट एवर इंफॉर्मेशन इज देर यू कैन लुक इट इन मल्टीपल वेज वन you can look at it and say okay the clout of india's banking sector or the importance of india's banking sector right it's very very high in the international market to such an extent that other countries are seeking our assistance and second even in the international relations if you are asked to basically discuss the 360 degrees the relation between india and Af afghanistan you can give this as an example which is promoting the relations between both india as well as afghanistan now understand what is happening here afghanistan is under taliban control and because many of the leaders under the taliban and the organization itself has attracted lot of sanctions the banking sector is affected because whenever any organization and individual is imposed or is coming under sanctions the companies or let's say the institutions within the same country will also be affected by this sanction and that is exactly what has happened i'll just give a very simple example and then you determine why this is so important many of the global organizations such as world bank right or even for that matter usa had proposed a lot of help or aid to afghanistan and because taliban has taken over sanctions have been imposed these assistance or this aid will not be provided now it has been stopped in addition to this within the banking sector within afghanistan there is allegation of embezzlement lot of corruption has been cited here or lot of corruption issues have been observed as a result of all of this the banking sector within afghanistan is under pressure just to give you a nugget here factual information until very recently more than 75% of the budget that was announced by the afghanistan government was in the form of foreign aid i'll repeat the statement so that it will sink into your mind more than 75% of the total expenses which were announced by the afghanistan government or 75% of the budget which was announced by the afghanistan government it was because of the aid that was provided by the international community now that has been stopped many of the global organizations or multilateral organizations which had offered assistance they have also stopped the assistance because of taliban takeover and because of all of this the banking sector is under pressure and banking sector mind you is very very important why whenever you talk about banking sector one feature that you will have to remember and that's the most important role of the banking sector is that it will provide lot of loans in the market it will help in mobilization of the deposits and help in investment in the economy and if a banking sector of a country such as afghanistan comes under pressure don't you think the overall investments in the country would be affected and it has been seen in many cases the bank doesn't have cash understand the statement here the customers claim that they have deposit they have kept money with the bank the bank doesn't have money to give the customers when they want to withdraw it and this has created an issue in afghanistan wherein the shops have goods sellers want to sell goods but people don't have money people don't have cash and that has led to a downfall or let's say a crisis in the afghanistan economy as well as per various estimates the world bank report itself the afghanistan's economy has shrunk in the last one year and in this context government of india let's say the banking sector in india has agreed to provide assistance technological know how assistance to afghanistan bank so that the banking sector will be improved so this is the gist of the article provided here let me go to the next article important article by the way cii ncar study the study has recommended that government of india needs to have a relook at 
various policies if the government wants to make india a hub of let's say manufacturing of chips or let's say electronics what is the argument here the confederation of indian industry cii and national council of applied economic research ncaer jointly have published a report the title of the report is building india's export competitiveness in electronics by 25 and 26 as per this report they observe that government of india set up a very high target of promoting production of electronics in india and also promoting the exports from india to rest of the world for example in the very same article it says that by 2026 the overall production of electronics in india should reach 300 billion dollars and the exports from indian market to the global market should be more than 120 billion dollars but if they want to achieve these targets the government has to alter the policy government has to look at the existing policies and review some of the policies now what are the policies first one dpiit department for promotion of industry and internal trade dpiit back in the year 2020 came out with a new guideline which stated that any neighboring country of india if they want to invest in india that is i'm talking about foreign direct investment i repeat any neighboring country if they want to invest in the indian market they will have to go through the approval route no exceptions will be provided they will have to go to approval route for example imagine sector a right now under sector a or industry a the fdi can be invested but it is through automatic route direct route the dpi dpiit's notification stated no this will not be applicable if this investment is coming from a neighboring country they will have to go to the approval route they will have to take the approval or the permission of the government first then they'll be allowed to invest now many of you will be confused and you'll be asking asking why did dpi to do this don't you think that will affect the investments in the indian indian economy coming from neighboring countries of course yes that was the objective understand the logic here during the pandemic there were certain companies which were feeling or which were under a lot of stress and the concern of the government here was that if the stress continues a chinese investor can come into india and end up purchasing a very important organization or very important companies in indian economy at throwaway prices at very very cheaper prices discounted prices can be offered and they will end up owning these companies to avoid that kind of a situation dpit notified that any investment coming from a neighboring country will have to go to approval or will have to go through approval route now this report or this survey says you will have to reverse it you'll have to change it why the argument that has been provided by the report is that most of the investors in china now are looking at china plus one strategy china plus one strategy which means rather than investing all their money only in one country why don't we diversify the investment why don't we invest in other countries apart from china so if you want to attract these kind of investments you will have to review this policy of the dpiit that's a first very important recommendation second very important recommendation follow this the second very important point is right now government of india imposes lot of taxes or duties on imports this report says it's a wrong approach it's not a correct approach why imagine you are manufacturing this marker and the plastic you have imported from some other country and you want to manufacture you want to export it to the global market now if government imposes tariff on the plastic when it is imported don't you think the cost of production of the marker would be higher and when the cost of production of the marker increases what do you think will happen to exports export competitiveness automatically will come down so government of india has to look at the way the duties are being implemented right now have to review them the third very important recommendation that has been provided is the subsidies or incentives are announced by the government but many of the times 
there is a delay in providing these incentives. So timely, on timely basis, the incentives have to be provided by the government to the exporters so that the exports can be promoted. So these are certain very important points provided in the study that has been published jointly by CII and NCAER. Let me go to the next article, just a factual information here, fertilizer subsidy. In the earlier videos as well or earlier week, weeks as well, we have been discussing a lot about fertilizer, just an addition to the earlier discussion. Very recently, the union cabinet, a government of India has announced that they are going to increase the subsidy for overall the fertilizers. That is in the last financial year, in the last financial year, the subsidy was somewhere right in the range of 1.6 lakh crore rupees. And this year, the government says that the overall subsidy will be much, much higher than 2.25 lakh crore rupees. Right? So basically, government of India acknowledging that there are various external factors which are at play here. And as a result of this, I don't have any option but to increase the allocation of fertilizer subsidy. Now, many of you will think that, sir, why should the government do it? Let, let them not announce subsidy because the fiscal deficit is very high. Revenue deficit is very high. Why is the government announcing subsidy? They should not announce it. They should be right giving no more subsidies for fertilizer. The problem with that is, if the government doesn't give subsidy, the prices of fertilizer will go up, will be very, very higher compared to whatever it is today. And that will put a huge burden on the farmers. Now imagine a situation where the country is already reeling with inflation rate. The farm inputs will become costly. I hope you understand. Connect the dots, it's very easy. A country where the food inflation is very high, overall inflation is also very high. The farm inputs cost will increase. One, it will have a huge impact on small and marginal farmer, no doubt. Second very important point is, if the farm inputs, which, which are already higher, further increase, what will happen to the output cost or let's say at what price the farmers will be willing to sell the crops in the market now, that would be much higher. And if the prices in the market for commodities keep on increasing like this, again the inflationary trend or the rate of inflation would be much, much higher. So there are various terms or let's say various repercussions which are associated with this idea of a fertilizer subsidy. But having said so, if government announces a fertilizer subsidy, what is the problem then? Revenue expenditure is higher, fiscal deficit would also be very, very high. Right? So these are certain very important points. Apart from this, how much is a subsidy announced for N, P, K and S? The data is given. Please don't buy heart. Not at all record for UPSC. At what price urea is being sold in the market? Article will tell you. 266 rupees, that is the price at which urea is being sold in the market to the farmers. Is it required for UPSC? No. For a very simple reason, this is for Rabi season. By the time you write the exam, one more season would be there and one more year would have been passed or let's say another 6 to 7 months would be over. At that point of time, again, what if government of India has changed the subsidy regime or has changed the amount of subsidy that is given to the fertilizer, the prices would be completely different. So you don't have to buy out anything and everything related to what is given in the article here. Let me go to the next article, the issue of discoms or distribution companies. Central government very recently has stated that the survival of the discoms is questionable now. Why? The central government has given lot many observations. Let's go one by one. Central government says that whenever the tariffs are decided, for the discoms, discoms are nothing but distribution companies. Those which will supply electricity to you and me. These discoms are owned by the private sector. There are various discoms or private sector is involved in the distribution of electricity. And many or let's say majority of the discoms are owned by the state government. The problem is that the discoms financial health has been the point of contention, has been a cause of concern. Not today, but for many, many years now. In fact, the current government itself has implemented many schemes such as Ujjwal Discom Assurance Yojana or revamped distribution sector scheme, etc. 
But despite many of these reforms being implemented, the DISCOMs, one, have not been able to meet the targets under that. And second, the financial stability or let's say the financial position of the DISCOMs has not changed by much. Now the central government says if this continues, survival of the DISCOMs itself will become a problem. Why? Why is the central government citing this? Let's look at the points here. First one, the gap between ACS and ARR is very high. It has widened right, in many of the states. And if this continues, there is a problem of losses to be incurred by the DISCOMs. Now, what is this gap of ACS and ARR? ACS stands for average cost of supply. ARR stands for average revenue realized, which means the cost at which the DISCOM is supplying electricity to you, it is higher compared to the revenue that is realized by the DISCOM. It is as simple as saying like this. Imagine I am a manufacturer. I will purchase or I will manufacture this product at 10 rupees, but I will sell it to you at let's say 7 rupees. So ACS is 10 rupee, ARR is 7. I am I'm incurring a cost of 10, but I am collecting only 7. Don't you think that's a loss for me? Of course, yes. That's the first problem. Second problem, government says even if the average revenue realized, that is the tariffs are revised upwards. If these are revised continuously by the state governments now, it is just going to address the issue, but it is not a long term solution. That is, it will help the discount to remain alive, but it is not going to address the issue of stress in the discounts. So one, the state governments anyways will have to revise the tariffs upwards because the state governments are actually involved in the process of deciding the tariffs. Second very important point, the losses incurred by the discounts are very, very high. The debt of the discounts are also very, very high. And the problem with high amount of a debt is that interest payments which are borne or which are paid by the discounts will be higher. And with the higher interest that is paid, the average cost of supply increases. Now look at the cycle here. Look at the problem with this. Interest becomes higher. Cost of supply increases. The gap between ARR and ACS widens. The losses of the discounts will widen. Again, the discounts will borrow. Interest increases. ACS increases. So this debt trap, I repeat, this particular debt trap will continue. Right? The central government says the discounts have, have fallen into a debt trap now. Third very important point. Many of the state governments announce a subsidy on the electricity supplied. But the problem is that they do not pay the amount of subsidy or let's say the um, their part of the expenses, they do not pay it on time. I hope you understand this. I'll repeat it. Imagine a state government will announce a subsidy on electricity rather than, rather than being sold at 10 rupee. Now it will be sold at 6 rupee per unit. Means the state government will have to bear the expenses of 4 rupee. But what if the state government delays paying this particular 4 rupee? Or the agencies of the state government, departments of the state government will delay in repaying or paying back this subsidy of 4 rupee. That will put again the pressure on the discoms. That is one more concern. So many of these concerns have been flagged by the central government. So what is the way forward then? What should be done? Center says, first and foremost, states should adhere to whatever policies we are right, announcing. For example, under RDSS, revamped distribution sector scheme, the aggregate technical and commercial losses of the discoms are supposed to be reduced. States should abide by this. The gap between ACS and ARR should be right narrowed down, should be zero. States should work towards that. So central government has announced policies. States should implement it. Second, rather than providing subsidy in this way, states should consider providing subsidies directly to consumers. I'll repeat it. Rather than providing subsidy in this way, that is idea of providing subsidy indirectly to the DISCOM rather than giving it to a DISCOM, why doesn't state directly target the beneficiary and provide the subsidies to the beneficiary? 
that's a second very important recommendation third very important recommendation is that whenever states have this concept of subsidies in electricity sector in the budget announced by the state government itself the subsidy allocation should be done so that there is no delay in paying the subsidy amount to the distribution companies so these are certain very important points which are discussed in the article here let's look at a question here the widening gap between acs and arr will add to the debt to burden of the discoms and what do i mean by here acs is greater than arr this is the concern so definitely yes et is going to add to the debt burden of the discom first statement is correct the gap between acs and arr has been constantly declining for the past five years just have a look at the table here the gap between acs and arr no in certain years it has declined in certain years it has increased so second statement is wrong right option for the question is option a only one is correct next article one more company has been imposed with penalties by the competition commission of india earlier we have we have discussed many companies being brought under the supervision or let's say under the regulation of cci or cci finding fault with the policies of the companies and imposing penalties now the latest company to come under the line of fire is google now what is it all about argument is simple imagine you purchase or you download an app from the google play store now when you download the app the app says you want to use the app you want to play certain games you will have to pay a certain amount of money for it you have to pay a certain amount and right? i'll give a very simple example netflix you have downloaded the app you want to use the services of the app but you are supposed to get the subscription what google proposed was whenever from the play store the customers right will download the app any payment that is supposed to be done will have to be done using the play store policy itself that is the payments have to be done through the google system itself you cannot give a link of a third party payment system for example imagine you open the netflix app and that is where netflix if you have downloaded you will know this in the apple product or in the apple mobile when you download it netflix does not have a subscription button there they will ask you to go to the website get the subscription then log in into this particular device so the argument is simple if you download it you want to make a payment you want to get a subscription then the payment has to be done within the google play store itself or the services which are prescribed by the google itself you are not allowed to use a third party payment system that was the policy which was announced by google couple of months ago or last year later it was extended in this year and finally right october the google stated that from october or let's say end of october this policy is going to be implemented all the app developers will have to follow the policy now you are an app developer you do not want to follow this policy of google then the google says i will not allow you to be listed in the play store i will not allow you to be listed now against this right the competition commission of india has noted and has imposed penalties on the google what is the argument of cci google has a dominant position in the market and it is abusing that dominant position and such abuse of dominant position will not be allowed citing that cci has imposed penalties on google and following the announcement of the penalties two things have happened one google has stated that this policy will be put on hold second google has stated that we are reviewing the order of cci and then we'll make a decision whether to appeal against it or not now many of you will basically say sir you took an example of apple apple also does the same thing why cci has not taken any action against it let me give an update in today's newspaper itself there was an article which says now cci is targeting apple company targeting in the sense it is looking into the policy of payments which is followed by apple company so after google now it is right the turn of apple company so these are certain important points regarding google and competition commission of india next article and the last article for the day federal reserve 
has announced a hike in the Fed policy rate or federal funds rate. Not the first time, multiple times the funds or the federal funds rate or interest rates have been hiked by Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve is simply nothing but a central banker of USA. And right now, the federal funds rate with this hike is in the range of 3.75% to 4%. 3.75% to 4%. Which means, now the interest rates in the US market will be in this range, not the earlier interest rates. Interest rates are going to go up. Why? Why has the Federal Reserve done this? Argument of Federal Reserve is very simple. Inflation rate is very high. Since March, inflation rate has been in the range of around 8%. Whereas the target of Federal Reserve is 2%. So target of 2%, inflation rate of 8%, no other option but for the Federal Reserve to increase the Federal Funds rate. First thing. Second thing, the Federal Reserve also says that the unemployment rate is also very low. The labor market is very tight. Unemployment rate is very low. Lot of demand is there for labor now. Which means the growth would be very high. Money supply would also be very high in the market. That will, that will basically contribute to inflation again in a higher way in the coming months. So we are going to increase the federal funds rate by 75 basis points. So citing this, the Federal Reserve has announced a hike in the federal funds rate and there is an impact of this. For example, within the Indian market, the foreign institutional investors turned sellers sold a lot of securities in the domestic market, withdrew the money and went back or let's say took their money outside India. So these are certain very important points regarding the decision of the Federal Reserve to increase the interest rates. So these are various articles as well as questions related to articles which have appeared from 29th October to 4th November 2022. If you like this initiative, hit the like button. Provide your valuable suggestions or comments in the section below. And if you have not yet subscribed to Baiju's exam prep IAS, what are you waiting for? Please subscribe now. Thank you. Have a great day.